So I want to thank everybody for, for being here with us and a special thanks to Angela for hosting and curating and to Emily for coordinating and to Tracy Bralla, the director of Venture Cafe. So I'll be sharing my work um, that's in the Academy of Natural Sciences exhibit, Invisible World of Water. And we're gonna get a look at the science behind the art and the art behind the science. This sculpture flourish embodies the themes of the exhibit. And it also is an homage to um, diatoms, the Academy's diatom collection, its matriarch, Chris Patrick, and also including snowflakes, architecture of snowflakes, uh, ice crystals, and even uh, Victorian diatom arrangements. My ceramic process is really full of science. And um, the, uh, we're gonna, be, with this focus on diatoms, we'll, you, we'll be looking at uh, behind the scenes with my research and drawings and the sculpting and also the science support that went into realizing the pieces that I made here. The Academy of Natural Sciences is our nation's first natural history museum. And it's also has the second largest diatom collection in the world. Invisible World of Water was curated by Marina McDougall. It's a gorgeous show. It's very complex. Um, it it, it uh, is the intersection of diatoms and ice crystals. So we're looking at uh, snowflakes and we have, I'm the only artist in the exhibit, but I'm with some of the the 19th, the pioneers of the 19th and the 20th century, including Ruth Patrick, Ernst Haeckel, Snowflake Bentley, Dr. Nagaya, who's a Japanese glaciologist. There's one uh, contemporary scientist in here and there are beautiful projections on the wall of his um, documentation of crystals growing in ice. They're very beautiful. So right here, we see my sculpture, Daughter Cells, that is um, an abstraction of binary fission, which is um, reproduction, asexual reproduction in single cell organisms. So it's celebrating thriving and growth. So this is one of the two large cases of diatoms in, in the exhibit and the detailed shots on the lower end show uh, the diatom campi lodisus that we're gonna get to see it in process in a little bit now. But um, I really wanna take this time to acknowledge the great team uh, behind this exhibit, um, especially Lauren Duguid, who's the Academy's designer and the director of installation. She did such a beautiful job with the entire show and also the brilliant support from um, Jennifer Sanchi, who's the senior uh, exhibition director and my amazing fearless science guide, um, Dr. Marina Potapovov, who is the director, um, the, the curator of the diatom collection. So diatoms are one cell. Um, some of us know that, but it's still, even when you know it, it's hard to really get it that they are one cell. So what, what I create and goes through multiple firings, it's all hand-built ceramic, is to really help magnify that unseen world that supports our life on earth. Diatoms are exquisite and essential. They are glass lace, they are silica and they house plankton. So they're, it's some of the smallest plants in the world too, but they photosynthesize more than a fourth of the oxygen for our planet. Um, they live in water, that's in fresh water, salt water, even the moisture in the soil. And they also create my, help make my artistic breath possible, which is really cool because Diatoms in the ocean, when they die, they fall down to the bottom of the ocean and it creates what we know as diatomaceous earth. We know this is used in a lot of filtering systems. It's used in agriculture, but it is my kiln brick. So it, it makes my kilns uh, and my firings possible. I have a, a very special fondness with diatoms. Um, so these pieces may be sitting in cases. They might be hung on the wall or installed on the wall or in a case. So um, they're also, you can see uh, colonies, this in the front here, this 
stellate colony, they fuse together because they know when they are work together that they can navigate into nutrient rich waters and they can be more powerful working as a team. This is this case here at the, over over this case is a very large plate from of by Ernst Haeckel. He was a 19th century scientist, artist, and philosopher. He gave us the were a number of words, including ecology and protist. And protist is the category that diatoms fall under because they are not plant or animal or fungi. Um, and this is a page from his very famous book that was published in 1899 called Art Forms and Nature. It is quite a thrill to have my work in the case with one of the early publications of Art Forms in Nature. And it was six years ago that Angela had offered me a show at Esther Klein Gallery. And so it was going to be my wildlife shields which had very colorful patterns on them, but I was gathering up my inspiration and my species in folders. And it looked like really 90% of everything I was gathering was from the sea. And that was not quite balanced, but I picked up art forms in nature and I was thumbing through it. And I came upon this actual very page. It's, it's actually with the one that they put into the exhibit. And I just thought these are shields waiting to be made, sculptures waiting to be made. And I, I just let it carry me literally out to sea. And so Angela curated my very first Le Maire exhibit. Um, adjoining the gallery, a part of the show is this is a historic reading room. And this is where they place a uh, flourish She's sitting next to Ruth Patrick, a portrait of Ruth Patrick. And um, I just want to also mention that they had a very, a very extensive renovation uh, in that room where the gallery is. It's a library that was never open to the public until a very big renovation occurred. And just um, it, it just was completed right as a pandemic was starting. So this show is one of the first ways to celebrate the the beautiful space and including this historic reading room. Um, so Ruth Patrick was such a pioneer and she was the first uh, woman director of the Academy of Natural Science and she, she really transformed it into the world-class um, education and research institute that it is today. She died in 2011, but she lived 105 uh, amazing years. And she was a world authority on freshwater ecosystems and helped set the stage for the modern environmental movement. She advocated for an integrated holistic approach to waterway health in her groundbreaking work in ecology. Um, she created something called a diatomist that's in the exhibit. And it's, it's like a float from a toilet tank, uh, like a copper float. And they used to make beautiful metal ones. And she um, had um, that cape kept it gather water. And um, she knew that if you looked at the, at the microscopic level, say the diatoms in the rivers and streams, you would be able to get a pulse on the health of the, of the waterways. She's the first one to do this. And she really um, established what is really known as, um, you know, water ecology today, extraordinary work. Um, some of the, those uh, equipment and things are in the, um, are in the exhibit. So now I'm going to share some highlights of the process behind floors and campylodiscus. So I really start with a lot of research, and these are some pages of what would be my sketchbook, but they're often filled with wild notes like this. And um, in these next slides, I started by um, looking for diatoms that would uh, be in snow and ice. And uh, these images are are some, they're all, remember, they're just from a microscope, but these were found in an ice core in a glacier in Peru, as are these, these guys made it into my sculpture, and also some um, diatoms from the poles, so that I could cover the whole globe in, in uh, with these diatoms. Now this page is um, some notes and drawings for the diatoms that were named for and by Ruth Patrick and also Dr. Marina Potapovov, who I'm, um, this is an homage to. Um, 
so they really can be a deep bow to the matriarchs of of the uh, academy. When you're a diatomist, you get to name you get to name the diatoms, and some of these diatoms they named, and some were named f f um, after them. So being at the academy, I had to make uh, this piece be very accurate. I really love um, abstracting and going into the essence of things, but I um, I had to make these accurate. And, and uh, I also wanted to represent um, each species with integrity and in a very specialized field like this, there's a whole new language and also a, a, a anatomy that you have to learn. Um, and I had a great help to do that, but um, I still was able to keep the work very accurate, but I could be playful by putting it together in uh, the, the sculpture that it became. Um, Marina was my 911 diatom lifeline call. And this is one of the visits to the academy while I was preparing. And she's scanning um, diatoms from a, a slide. Um, and she scanned layer by layer to create these absolutely beautiful three dimensional images that are in the exhibit. Um, you can also see some of the pages from um, diatom, uh, microscopic images of diatoms. But she really was amazing. And when I couldn't um, understand or couldn't find an image of a certain side of a diatom, I would text her or, or we'd call or email. And, um, and, and uh, she helped me through all that, that, that uh, discovery. The image on the right is a drawing from the 1800s. It's a photograph of the drawing, but she showed this to me on a visit. I was so blown away by how wild it was. I, I had to include it. It became the centerpiece of the matriarch side of my sculpture. And on the left, you can see my drawings from my sketchbook and notes. And in the center is a microscopic image of this diatom skeletonema. And it's starting to form uh, colonies in this one because they connect those flanges connect that way. So this diatom is called Ludicola. It's one uh, example of one from the ice and snow. And on the right, you can see the image uh, in the microscope of them forming colonies, which I just think is so beautiful. On the left is a page from my sketchbook and notes. Um, and this is also Campylodiscus. It's so crazy, so complex. So here are some drawings of the diatoms and research for, uh, for Ruth and uh, Marina. And uh, on the right are uh, drawings that uh, came from Ernst Haeckel, Art Forms in Nature. This diatom um, was named by Ruth Patrick in 1945 and made its way into the sculpture. And these are plates of Ernst Haeckel's work um, from Art Forms in Nature. And the highlighted diatoms up on the left side, they uh, are two of the three diatoms I chose that rest on those, uh, the stems. This is the third that Marina, I said, do you have a favorite diatom? And she, she showed me this. She says, it's one of the smallest diatom species that there is, and it's called Discotella. It does live in the Arctic, so it was good. It fit into the theme, but it, it's gotta be the world's tiniest little disco ball. I love the name. Um, here are my drawings. And uh, once I got into the clay, things did, to shift a bit that that happens in process but on the left is view a the diatoms of snow and ice and on the right is the matriarchal side so now we can dive into um to the clay process here so i started in the center and um and it's interesting because round diatoms are called centric, but they are in the center, it was perfect. And I reinforced this, these, both of these sides because they were going to be bearing the weight of the diatom surrounding that. Here is the other uh, one for the matriarchic side, skeletonema being sculpted. And then I married the two to form the heart of Flourish. With that done, I made the diatoms just like that, you know, here we go, one slide, there they are. But these are the diatoms from snow and ice. You can see that some of them were very complex. 
uh, this one in particular, I it was hard to um, to get the right images and to understand what was really going on inside it. Because when you're building something 3D, you have to have a complete understanding of the whole piece. The images on the left are are um, microscopic images, and there you can see my clay process here on the right. So the diatoms, I laid them out. They each found the happy place they could be uh, with each other. And I started to attach them onto the centerpiece. And you can see I already had to plan the footing for the, the seal rod I fabricated that will go in um, right there. You can see that. So I could get half of them on, but then I had to move all the piece onto clay support so that I could get uh, attached the other half of the wheel. And then I started this piece, Campylodysis, thinking that it was going to be a part uh, attached to that sculpture, but I was in for a surprise. So um, this is, uh, uh, Marina sent me these images on the right. It is, she says it's one of the most mysterious of all the diatoms. And of course I'm going to be making this thing, but um, I have two slides to show you just of the process, but it is very, very complex. Um, it's kind of a mind bending. So diatoms are two parts put together, meaning die too. And they're connected by what's called a girdle. So here I've done, I did the full interior and exterior of each half and then put them together. And even though you don't really see all of it, you get a peek at some of it. And I, I just wanted to really get the, get the get this diatom on the inside and out. On the left are some other views of it and um, the surface detail. So you can see that she needed, she wasn't going to be attached to into a, a sculpture. She's in her own, uh, on her own little space in the, in the case that we saw earlier. So here are the diatoms for the matriarch side. And uh, on the lower left, the Sorella Patrike was, was another very complex piece. And I loved how the sponges, the things that you can use in your studio as artists, we, we have to be, we're all, all of us can be very innovative, but the, uh, the sea sponges were a great support on this piece. Um, here it is at that point, I couldn't, I had to put the piece down. And so I put it down on the kiln shelf where it would not move again <clears throat> until I put the shelf into the kiln. It's sitting on kiln blanket. This is an incredible material is developed by NASA to um, deflect heat on the space shuttle. And it's a lifesaver for these very delicate pieces that I work with. The red circles show the, the footings for the, the post and also where I will place the stemmed diatoms after the firing. So I got all the diatoms on and they're all nestled in their little kiln blanket. And here are the petite diatoms all together. And then this little star is being guided by Ernst Haeckel's drawing uh, in the background. So it goes in the kiln. Of course, I soaked it and very for like a day or so. And then I put the lid down. And the very first firing is always very critical because that's when it might blow up or not. So this was a very grateful day when I opened the kiln and saw her all in one piece. And during this time, we had just moved out of the house that we'd been in for a long time. And it was a very epic change. And um, I made did all of this work at the dining room table because the studio was under complete process. But silver lining is when you move. I had a wardrobe box, which made the most perfect temporary spray booth. So I set her up in there and we built the base so I could even just airbrush her and manage that. So she got airbrushed with white under glaze, all the surfaces, and then back in the kiln. There she is in the kiln. And then that went through a hotter firing that time. It came out and then I repeated again, but this crazy green surface is actually clear glaze. And I airbrushed and hand painted. It took a number of days to do that. And at this point, the glaze, when it's in the kiln at that heat, which is the highest temperature of this firing is like 1940 degrees. 
this might be an 1830 degree firing, but if the glaze touches anything in that heat, it will fuse permanently to it. So it had to ride through this firing on stilts very carefully. So here it is going in the kiln and here me opening the lid. It's crazy the transformation occurs in, in the ceramic process. Um, and then there's a detail I bent down in the kiln to get that shot of it's resting on its post. And then this is the final firing. This intense blue is actually a mother of pearl luster. It looks so strong at this state and it changes so dramatically, but it is that sheer iridescence that's so pretty on a ceramic. Um, so that it is going through that process and coming out on Campi Ladiscus, you can see like the kind of the sheer rainbow on that. So with all the firings done, then I was able to silver leaf the, the steel support post and the stems. And then here's my dear friend, Rich. And um, he's my photographer. He's a cinematographer. He's my collaborator on interdependence. It's at the, that was at the Missioner Art Museum in the Rising Tides exhibit. And here we are uh, doing the photo shoot on Flourish. And he wore the most perfect shirt for sure that day. He had just come back and his wife had just come back from some time at Woods Hole. So here's the legend that I created. It, it's at the exhibit. It's also on my website with this piece. Um, and there's a description here, but it also names the 21 diatoms by species and habitat and geographical range. So the title, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the title, Flourish was, um, uh, really references an ancient sacred geometry symbol called the flower of life. Its feminine energy embodies the cycle of creation and the blueprint and interconnectedness of the universe. Her intention blossoms with the universal gifts within us all needed to make the crucial changes now as a planet. At this climacteric time, we must take action that considers all life, all people, and our environment as if our lives depended on it because they do. The only way that we can move forward is together. We have brilliant role models in the diatom colonies in our waterways and the primary producers, our coral reef systems in the ocean, the fungi and tree systems of our forest, the atmosphere created by our flora family to neighboring planets and stars, we are intrinsically linked. And our human infrastructures need transforming to honor the life that makes our lives possible. We are stewards of this planet. And this time is an incredible wake up call. Millions of years show us that rich diversity and reciprocity fuel thriving communities and environments. This light giving flow has enabled life to thrive for eons. Even in this very stressful time, there are incredible innovations being made every minute. We are creating the future right now and we have inspiration everywhere from microscopic to macro. The Invisible World of Water is up through April 17th. And please let me know if you would like to see the exhibit with me, or if you have interest in um, exhibiting uh, any of my this work or wanna learn more about Flourish, just please contact me. Angela can share uh, these this information in the chat. I really thank you all for sharing this adventure with me. Thank you so much, Margarita. That was such a great presentation. And I loved how you went through your whole process. How long did it take you total to make this piece? Um, it was really over about five, six or five months with research and everything. The actual sculpting part took um, was really a good, a good three solid months more. Yeah, it's uh, and that's nice. when I say that, that's really all I did. <laughs> <laughs> Every wow. waking moment. Oh, should I stop sharing the screen now? Oh, uh, sure, if you'd like to. Okay. 
don't know if there's anything else. Anybody had any questions? Well, I had a question. Can so I loved how you showed us your like um, creation process of of the actual clay piece. Can you talk a little bit about your research process and how you create all of these sketches? Because you seem to have such an extensive knowledge of all of these these diatoms. Um, well, I really um, I love learning and. And when I, I have something to do like this, I just dive in and I, I do a lot of research. So um, I do a lot of dreaming and a lot of thinking, but I also, um, it's helpful that our friends, some of our science friends, if, if that's the arena that we're in, can really help us. So I really talk to people, I research, um, I just take it in in every way that I possibly can. And, and then I, you know, the drawings and the notes um, really take off on the pages uh, with a life of their own. <laughs> um, I hope that, I don't know if that answered your question fully, but. Definitely. And, and they really do resemble Ernst Heckel's sketches. It's, it's amazing how, how closely related they are. Thank you. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for Margarita? Well, I, I want to thank Margarita. Margarita, um, can you make get not share your screen so we could all see you? Absolutely. I just think Mar Margarita is a marvel. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> a wonderful example of a research artist. And uh, she really does her homework and She's articulate. And I think the statement that you made at the end about the title is so meaningful. And I just want to thank you. Thank you, Diane. That means a lot. Thank you so much. One of the most amazing things um, that um, I chair yeah, about ahead. Margarita and her work is that um, she may be doing sculptures of the most minuscule single cells on the planet, but she has this expansive global um, um, picture in her in her um, thoughts and, and presentation of these tiny, tiny little things and how they impact um, our lives and the bricks in her <laughs> in her kiln and um, you know the fact that they, give us um, a quarter of the oxygen um, of, you know, that we breathe. I mean, all these facts are just absolutely amazing. And I would not know or understand any of them if it wasn't for Margarita. <laughs> um, well, I, I say that um, she, she what takes my breath away and gives me um, breath to breathe, you know, something like that. You're so amazing, Margarita. Thank you. Well, Thank you, you know, I didn't know what any of these things were either, but like I'm telling you when I saw that, uh, I've, I've taught, you know, projects um, on Ernst Haeckel. And so it wasn't new to me, but I, I was revisiting that book. But when I thumbed, it's all a matter of timing. And for all of us, when things just line up, it, you know, things can spark or they develop at their as they need to in our lives but at that point looking at that page was like oh my god these are shields and they they need to be made and i didn't even know what i was looking at they were just so beautiful i was uh preparing that show with angela and i remember you get to the point where you have to tell the curator titles and stuff like that and I didn't even still know what they really were then. So I had to find out quick, hurry up. And I found out, oh, it's a diatom and that's a radiolarian. And what are they? But then I got to find out what they were. And, and when you find out these things that we can't even see that have created like the atmosphere on a planet, some of the earliest plants on the planet and all these things, you just you can't help but totally fall in love with them. They are absolutely beautiful. But when you think about what they do for us, no matter what we do, they continue to do this beautiful job, making this um, our planet livable, making this blue planet 
uh, for us. And uh, so I, I learn as I go, I saw a beautiful image of what was radiolarians reproducing. I didn't know what binary fission was, but I learned because I had to understand what I was making, but that's how I do. I think you learn as you go, but most all of us do that. Margarita, I just love how you're modeling, making a connection to the real world around us as kind of a bypass to this mediated ideas about what nature is, instead connecting with it in this really emotional and intellectual way driven by curiosity and a desire to love more deeply yeah the things that bring us you know so much joy just in seeing i mean even just seeing this 19th century imagining of the same thing that's captured your very attention you know like through also that historic transmission it's just like your project has every has everything and i love your connection to like our printed material culture and the different ways that we're able to perceive nature around us. Yeah. Great work. I love it. Thank you so much. I think right now um, we don't have a moment to waste. Um, we can't think about imagining the world anymore. We like Diane is a really an activist and a, a woman of action. And um, we really we've done. I've been really fortunate get to exhibit with Diane and present with Diane um, at the AGU in DC. She invited me to be on a panel that she uh, curated and uh, did a lot of work to make that happen. There were twenty six thousand Earth and Space scientists meeting in DC that year, and I I was on a panel with Diane and then the scientists. That was extraordinary, but that's just a real honor to get to really um get to live and be in action of what we we are passionate about it's it's a a a, a great blessing um to get to do what we love but we all have to do a lot more right now and there's just no messing around with that because it's the time is ticking and we can totally turn it around but it's like we are creating our future right now. The pandemic has been an incredible wake up call. We don't know what's next because we're creating it now. That's a really beautiful way to say that. And I love how you're you know, shedding a light on these invisible processes that happen but are so important to all of our lives. Um, yeah. And I really enjoyed watching your work evolve over the years. I feel <laughs> like um, you've, you've gotten really a lot more detailed and intricate and it, the work that you're making now is like, I don't know how it's even possible. <laughs> like how, I don't know, you're just, it's, it's the, the technique is, is so good and well Thank done. Thank you. I don't always know either. <laughs> but I just know that I want to keep going and I, I, I just want to uh, keep expanding and um, why bother doing anything unless we're going to really go farther with each thing that we do and we think or, or we make. So, yeah. Uh, Nefer Nefertiti is a piece that I made for the Missioner Art Museum and it's in their collection now. Um, Laura helped arrange purchasing that piece and they have an exhibit they have just putting together of 25 pieces in their collection that's going to uh, be opening on January 26th through May 15th so it's nice that she's going to be on view again. Um, if anybody's able to go see it's called the work of art at the Missioner Art Museum. You have a copy of, I mean a photo of that that you could share real quickly. Or is it not easy to access? That piece is just blows my mind. Um, it's on my website. Yeah. I know I'm asking a lot. No, it's not. <laughs> Margarita, I have a quick question. First yeah. of all. Yeah. Hi, Heather. Thank you for Hi. being here. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I really share your love of nature and your concern about the impending Anthropocene and the state of the planet. Um, I I have a Kind of tricky question but i think it's good for all of us to be aware of and that is if you could talk a little bit about your process in terms of your failures and your trial and error and how you um 
I kind of see your work touching upon both art and design in the planning stage and the research stage. And I'm wondering if you build prototypes at all, if you made smaller models that failed, and if they did fail or there were some trial and error stories, if you could share those with us. Absolutely. One comes to mind immediately. Um, so, um, do I make models? When um, I was doing like large scale, like six foot pieces, larger than that, not ceramic, um, I did make models. It's interesting, the models were often heavier than the larger pieces because I was, I would, was making them out of wax and casting them in bronze. Um, bronze is quite heavy. But the but they told me they wanted to get big and they usually told me what material they wanted to be when I was doing that work in like 2010 and um, uh, rice paper was one that piece called um, premier pas which means first step in French that that's uh, installed right now at hotbed um, to be on view, but um, in clay. No, I don't make models and sometimes I'll start and I have no idea what the piece will look like because it's very intuitive. But for a piece like Flourish, I had to do the drawings first and show them, you know, and um, and it, it's good because the nature of this piece, that was the best thing to do. But when I did my sponge abstracts, um, and Nefertiti, I, I didn't really have, a, I just let it come through me and I really listened to the clay and I listened to what this piece is about and what it wants to say. And that's really how I work. But uh, about things I don't, um, you might, we might call it a failure. I don't call it a failure. I call it um, a change of plans. So uh, when I was working on Nefertiti, I thought I had finished after weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of making this piece uh uh it was a friday night it was all covered in plastic and uh it really it took on i was showing it to my daughter lucy who's on here now and she's like mom it really looks like nefertiti and i was like gosh it does it looks like that profile of that of her bus which i got to see in berlin at the egyptian museum but so the next day i come down to show pierre and it was uh like March 7th. So we are, things are heating up in the pandemic. There's a great strain in the world. And yet our country wasn't really prepared for COVID. Although we had already lost people with COVID at that time, there was great tension. I just say that because it really feeds into what happened. So I came down to show Pierre the piece and it, there's nothing upright under the plastic. It was all low. And I was like, oh God, my, my pieces don't fall apart. My pieces don't break at this point. I, I'm, I might have had one piece kind of blow up once in the kiln, but I, I'm very careful and thoughtful. So I lifted up the plastic and it had come apart and it was in so many pieces. And um, I was so busy. I had a lot of shows and I had so much going on. And then there was this, you know, the pandemic. Um, but I feel like uh, that thing completely came apart. And I feel like it was, obviously there's science and physical reasons why that happened. The weight and thing fell over, but I think energetically it was just, it had to come apart. And, um, and it's like, everything has to come apart right now. The things that aren't working, the infrastructures on our planet that are not serving everybody, they must all come apart so we can start new. And it's like she was a symbol because she rose from the ashes. I didn't have that much time. And Diane knew, Diane was in that show, but uh, I had such little time to finish that piece. But then uh, within that same week, it got shut, we had the pandemic on March 13th and it shut down. And then Laura gave me the call and said, it's gonna be delayed. So with like every minute that I had, I had more time to work on Nefertiti and which is Egyptian, actually her name is, her English translation is the beautiful woman has come, which that's what Nefertiti means. She's a female Pharaoh, he was so powerful. Um, so that piece became a completely different piece because it came apart. So it had to be new, it had to have a new life and it had to be completely transformed, which 
I was able to go farther. I had never done anything. It was the most complex piece to date in my career at that time. The piece that I did flourish and then my, my floral flora shield life is also in that category of like going to another level for me. But yeah, I think amazing things can happen when you think it may be called a mistake of a mistake is only a judgment. Oh, thank you, Rich. You already probably had that up there. Yeah, of course now. I had thank it. I had, to, I had to find a way to sneak it in. So thank it's my you background. so much. Here, I'll get my face out of the way. The um, <laughs> the um, the sculpting is one thing, but Nefertiti, I was, I did things that I never, I wanted to. Um, I was able to do things very isolating glaze and leaving the whole body unglaze. So to do a lot of technique that was enabled those eggs to be glossy and white uh, and, and iridescent. So I, that's, I, that's, that's my response to that, Heather. <laughs> Margarita, I just want to ask you about one thing you said at the beginning. Um, you said your, your sculptures tell you what material they want to be. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, when I was in, uh, did my master's and I, I, they didn't have a ceramic program, but it didn't matter because I, I, I've lived my whole life in clay. So I I was working on a lot of different materials and um, I moved here from Seattle after 27 years. I didn't know a soul here, everything was new. And I was kind of like rearranging my molecules and changing everything and working, for listening inside to see what could come out of me. I, I, I knew I had to do this move. I felt like the most important work in my life was in front of me and I hadn't done it yet. And I just didn't even know what it looked like and or, or what it would be or how to do it. But when I was, uh, I did a lot of uh, work in foundry because I was also working on a meditation garden that was up on three acre that I did in three acres in Baltimore. So I was finishing some of the, the, the bronze for that um, meditation garden and I'd work in the wax and wax is really great for me because it's like clay. And I really like plastic materials, meaning they move and bend and they're flexible. Um, so I would make these smaller pieces and and then I, I was casting them in bronze, but yeah, I just thought I did a lot of things in Angela and they were all organic forms and they were abstract, but they were all both based on, uh, it's a lot of what I still care about growth, life. Um, and, and I, I was very aware back then that uh, but we have to be adaptable. We have to be flexible because we are in a big change. And I we could feel it back then. Um, I was in a personal change, but I felt it collectively too. So I just think if you're going to grow up and be a really big sculpture, what do you want to be? And um, one piece I did was six foot that big um emergence like that that piece was an abstraction of root systems in oak tree roots underground graft together they form miles and miles of an interconnected system and so this piece i did was a, a a takeoff on that so it was like emerging into a new world so it came up above the ground and it was very heavy i made it out of the materials that you use when you build foundry molds plaster the fibers um the st in steel and this was a big heavy piece and i covered it with red iron oxide um and and then i thought once you get above ground you don't need all this weight anymore and i was like we have to change it so i built another piece and used that emergence as a positive mold all these are based on the techniques and the process that i was going through in foundry so i when you're making a mold in foundry, you use uh, roof flashing to go between the sections so they don't connect. So I built a mold, a piece over it, and I thought I want it wants to be light and it really wants to float and it really wants to fly. So I did it out of rice paper. I did I did have to do um, this is one thing I did that Heather I was in a very new area so I did do test a ton of testing and I did small pieces for this kind of this piece I did um, and I, I found out how to make the structure of the rice paper hold itself up by making ribs 
and Pierre was a great influence and help with me being the architect and designer that he is. But I tore the rice paper into many small pieces and I used a bath of like Elmer's glue and water and dipped it. And I made a skin over the big piece that was shrunk wrapped so it wouldn't stick to the actual sculpture emergence and made a skin for the piece that became Premia Pa. And, and Angela has exhibited that piece. She, bless her heart, rented a U-Haul and took it up to North Adams, Massachusetts. But that piece um, hangs on the ceiling. So I took the pieces off after I built them. It, that took months to do because I was tearing millions of pieces and building the what I call ribs to make a structure so that the rice paper could hold itself up. When I took it off, it was like butterfly wings. It was so delicate. So I, I did ribbing on the interior when it was off. And then I put it back together and I thought, oh, go back together and it'll be like a lightweight one. And, and I, but no, it really wanted to be up in the air. So I, um, I, I turned it upside down and it, and it floats. But uh, that's, that's, um, that's, that's part of that, some process. It's a gorgeous um, piece. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Margarita? No, but I have a can talk. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, Angela, I want to answer one of your earlier questions. How Margarita get into these things? First, you have to find the right dining room table. Okay. <laughs> and uh, cover everything with clay. But there's one thing with she starts to work on a piece of paper, drawing, thing like that. And it's amazing, after 10 years, every time I see the work, I am surprised. I am terrified when she put it in the kiln because I know what can happen. I think I'm more afraid than she is. I'm terrified for he is. the whole night, okay? He doesn't after sleep when the kiln's on. After 10 years, I've seen every time this kind of work, which looks like clay, like, not, I don't want to say not much, but it's clay transforming itself with a fire. I think it's fantastic and I always get surprised. I always will be surprised with a clay and with Margarita, of course. I mean, it says, <laughs> but it's absolutely incredible to watch. And for 10 years, you don't get tired of it. And sometimes, yes, yeah, a little bit, yeah. But it's wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. It's like magic almost, you know, to see that. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess, Margarita, you really know the material and you know how to stretch it and, you know, stretch it to its limits and keep it standing. I, I, I told her everything. I told her everything. I, I've been working with the, the it's low fire clay that I work with. A lot of people think it's porcelain when it's white, uh, but it's white because it's, well, the clay is white, but it's really white when I airbrush it, a white underglaze. But um, I've been working with it for you. My Japanese teacher, Masako Miyata, introduced me to this clay because when I started it, and um, I started actually working in clay when I was probably six years old because we would go to the uh, the street behind our house was a dead end. It ended at a, we called it Little Beach. It was on the um, Lafayette River. And I found clay at the beach and I made, started to naturally, nobody showed me, but I naturally started making little pinch pots and things. And I would dry them on the um, driftwood and I made shelves and I couldn't wait to go to Little Beach every day I could. To, to do that and play outside, be outside and, and play with the clay. But then um, I did um, get to, there wasn't really much art where I went to high school or in much of the school. So I, I found a, um, at a, at a outdoor park, I asked a potter, somebody in clay, if she would teach me. And she said, I don't teach, but that woman over there does. So I went over to this woman, ended up being Betty Kite. It ended up that her brother-in-law delivered all of us Hagens, and I have 10 brothers and sisters. So um, I would ride my bike to Betty Kite's um, uh, through, throughout high school. And I, I learned to throw on the wheel and I did a little hand building, but I knew that, uh, 
throwing on the wheel would never satisfy me. Even when I was very young, I, I think it was a good skill that I needed to learn, but it was never going to be enough. When I went to James Madison University, the first thing I knew I needed to do was just to sign up for a ceramic class. I was thinking, why are you going to make a living and stuff like that? It wasn't a, it wasn't a big uh, weighing on me too much as I I didn't live there that long in those places, but I did take a science class because I thought maybe nursing, I like helping people, but it was the most boring biology class in the world. So um, I was at so at home and I felt like I could breathe when I was in the ceramic class. I had Masako Miata, who was an extraordinary ceramicist and a, a great influence and a great light in my life. And in that class, I felt like I walked through a threshold and I knew when she introduced the low fire clay where I could really, I could really start to speak. And it was a beginning for me. Hmm. Wow, that's an amazing story. Yeah, but I've been working in it since then. So it's good. You get like an old friend. <laughs> so you mentioned when you came to Philadelphia from Seattle, that was like this transition period for your practice. Um, I know you've been in the same house for a, a very long time. Everyone's probably been to your studio at some point for post or for a class. Um, how are you adjusting to your, your brand new studio space? Um, well, it's it's a very efficient space and it's made with a lot of love, Pierre, and we worked on it and he and his son Fabrice came and they tore a drop ceiling out and it was their somebody's uh, like a TV type movie room and um, I ripped up the carpet and we had our dear electrician Oscar um, do rewire had to rewire the house and everything so we're we're loving it up and we're doing a one baby step at a time one thing i think pierre and i can both say we love we love west mount air we love being around the trees i it was very hard to leave the city but i think some of us love being by the city and the culture and the network and so, and we also love nature so i love having both um this is like a little bit of both in one place. Some people have two separate places that do that for them, but uh, we're really five minutes from the Wissahican trails and um, the tree, it, it feels good out here. I just must say that, although it was very, I had time to prepare uh, in, in, inwardly for this big move, but it feels like a relief because it was time to leave that very big house. It's too much for, it just, it had served a beautiful purpose and it was a great um, uh, place for community and people coming together for my classes. And it, I think it, it had been, is like we often refer to it as Pierre's mistress, mistress because it was one of the bigger relationships in his life, him and the house. <laughs> but uh, now we're, 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 we're putting the energy and the love into this house. So it's a, it's a change, but I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Uh, so Margarita, it's Maria. How are you? <laughs> You're doing a fabulous job. I'm in the car driving. So just don't mind me for a second. I just wanted to say this whole, uh, journey that you've been on, I've, I've enjoyed watching from the beginning of when I met you in school. And I remember it started with roots and you made a whole book on it. And you, you, I remember the, the ribbing of the, the sculpture, the, I can't remember the name of it, but I, 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 I yeah. Uh, so I just wanted everybody to know how you are such a nature loving human that just learns and and teaches all of us the, the most beautiful lessons and i am appreciative to have been able to um learn with you thank so you thank maria you. thank you so much i'm so glad you were able to be here and uh likewise it's a uh, yeah it's mutual well, for all of us you're a fabulous fabulous person so thank you um, thank you I'll, maria. I'll mute myself now <laughs> bye thank you maria yeah yeah, Marie and I met in grad school. So yeah, she we got to she got this once because through a lot of growing pains, a lot of a lot of work. 
Does anyone else have any last questions or comments for Margarita? Could we put in the chat or um, the, um, I don't know if you have the, the links. I do, yeah, I put them in the chat earlier, but I'll- Oh, you did, I'll, thank you, I'm sorry. I just was not, I didn't see that. I'll do it one more time for anyone who missed it. Um, so hopefully you guys can go see this work in person. It's, it's fantastic. Um, so thank you so much, Margarita, for sharing thank tonight, you. sharing your process and, and, and talking about all of this with us. And thank you everyone for coming. Yeah. Thank you so much, Angela. And I so appreciate everybody being here and everybody that's going to be watching this recording. Thank you so much. It will be posting it. Yeah, it'll be on YouTube.